Welcome to Ilford High Road Baptist Church. This is our recording for Sunday the 14th of February. So how appropriate that we are considering the question asked to our Lord Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? And we'll find that as we read together from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and from Mark chapter 12. Our first reading today comes from the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, entitled The Great Commandment. These are all the laws that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. Obey them in the land that you're about to enter and occupy. As long as you live, you and your descendants are to honour the Lord your God and obey all his laws that I'm giving you, so that you may live in that land a long time. Listen to them, people of Israel, and obey them. Then all will go well with you, and you will become a mighty nation and live in that rich and fertile land, just as the Lord, the God of our ancestors, has promised. Israel, remember this. The Lord and the Lord alone is our God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Never forget these commands that I'm teaching you today. Teach them to your children. Repeat them when you are at home and when you are away, when you are resting and when you are working. Tie them on your arms and wear them on your foreheads as a reminder. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. We're now going to turn over to the New Testament. Mark chapter 12, and I'm going to read from verse 28, entitled, The Great Commandment. A teacher of the Lord was there who heard the discussion. He saw that Jesus had given the Sadducees a good answer. So he came to him with a question. Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus replied, The most important one is this. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second most important commandment is this. Love your neighbour as you love yourself. There are no other commandments more important than these two. The teachers of the law said to Jesus, Well done, teacher. It is true, as you say, that only the Lord is God and that there is no other God but he. And to love God with all your heart, with all your mind and with all your strength and to love your neighbour as yourself is more important than to offer animals and other sacrifices to God. Jesus noticed how wise his answer was. And so he told him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After this, nobody dared to ask Jesus any more questions. Uh, This Sunday is uh, known as Valentine's Day, 14th of February, when we usually try and find some way to express our love for someone who is close to us. It may not be quite so easy to get the things we might want to get uh, this year. But then love is more than a pretty card with some sentimental words. It's more than a bunch of roses and it's more even than a whole chocolate orange. Love is more than an emotion or a feeling that can change frequently. And yet the Hebrew word does speak of affection and delight in something or someone. It speaks of a strong attachment to somebody. The Greek word agape considers the welfare of others. It's a selfless, sacrificial love. It's pure. And it wants what is good for others. And while that love involves feelings, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that at all, love is more than simply an emotion. Love is the decision of my will. It's a choice to act out of deep, lasting concern for others. And such love requires faithfulness, commitment, and sometimes sacrifice. Jesus loved 
like that. He loved God and he loved others. And he calls us to walk as he walked and to minister his grace and his love to those who are around us. And so the first thing we say this morning is, let us love God for all we're worth. This is, after all, the first commandment. In our passage from Mark's Gospel today, a scribe comes and asks Jesus this question. Teacher, which commandment is first of all? Now, he doesn't mean which is the first in time or which is the first on a list, say, for example, of the, the Ten Commandments. That would be very obvious. But the word first can mean principle or, or most important. So we talk of the principle or main characters of a novel. In the United States, they talk about the first lady. And so the scribe comes and, and he's asking Jesus, what is the first? What is the most important commandment? And Jesus says the first is this, to love God. And the great thing is that Jesus does not only tell us what the first commandment is. He also tells us how we are to keep it. Now, we are to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. Now, we're not going to try and analyse those four words too much because, after all, we're not a surgeon with a knife in hand in a theatre. We're, we're disciples who, who want to know how to walk as Jesus walked. And Jesus says, love God with all of your heart. The heart represents our affections, our feelings, but it's more than that. Proverbs 4 says, guard your heart because out of it are all the issues of life. In other words, the way that you live all of life is determined by what's in your heart. Now you might say, but sometimes don't we say things but we don't really mean them? Or we can act graciously when inside we're feeling really angry. And yet we do that sometimes. But even those actions come from the heart. Because even when we don't feel like being kind or gracious, those actions come from a heart that wants people to think that we are. The opposite is when we talk about wearing our heart on our sleeve. Everyone can see what we think and what we're feeling. And we are called to love God genuinely with the whole of our heart. That is, to love God exclusively. Now, of course, we, we love our family, our parents, our friends. And Jesus says, love your neighbor. But no one has the place that the Lord has within our hearts. He alone is God. He alone sits on the throne of our lives. So we're to love God with the whole heart. We are then secondly to love God with all of our soul. And that's the Greek word suke that comes from a verb meaning to blow or to breathe. And hence in Genesis we read that God breathed into man the breath of life and he became a living soul. So suke may refer to the breath that we breathe, it may refer to the human soul, it might refer to our affections and our will. Or it may refer to me as a, a, a whole human being and therefore mean the whole of my life. And so to love God with our soul is to love God with our whole self. With all that we are, not holding anything back. As the song says, Lord, I, I give you my soul. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, I live for you alone. And so to love God with all the soul means that there are no areas of my life which I say, that's simply mine. Or to think of life as, as a, a home with, with many rooms in. To love God with all our soul means there are no rooms to which I hold the key and lock the door. To love God with all our soul is to love God all the time and in everything on Sunday and on Monday, at home and at work, at school and at play. And then says Jesus, love God with all your mind. We're to love God when we think about God, when we remember what God has done, when we meditate upon God's glorious character. 
We love God as we apply our minds to read his word, to, to think about it and to commit it to memory. We love God when we have thoughts that are pure and clean. There is a real battle for our minds because it is so important. What we think about, what we allow our minds to dwell upon is so crucial. And we love God when we take captive every thought and bring it into submission to the will of God. So for example, at work, our line manager gives us that task that we hate. And immediately there are complaining thoughts that come into our head. Or we sit down one evening once we finish clearing up and we put the television on and it's halfway through a film that has images that are likely to cause impure desires for us. Or someone says something that really hurts. And our mind goes into overdrive, driven by anger. Now in all of those moments, we face a choice. We can allow those tiny little seeds to settle and take root, or we can sweep them away. And to love God with all of our hearts is to allow the word of God to replace those wrong thoughts with right thoughts. The thoughts of God's word that says, do everything without complaining. The word of God that says, whatever is pure, think on those things. And be kind and gracious, forgiving each other because God in Christ has forgiven you. In our thought life, we are to love God. And then we're to love God with all of our strength. The Greek word is iskos, that means strength, it means power, it means ability. And strength is what we need to complete all the tasks of each day. And therefore to love God with all of our strength is to love God in everything that we do. Not only some things like leading home group, teaching jigsaw, sharing and outreach events, but all that we do each day of the week. As Paul instructs the Colossians, whatever you do, in word, in deed, do all of it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter says, if anyone serves, let them serve with the strength that God provides. And Peter's not just speaking to pastors as if, as if they're the only ones who serve God. He's addressing each member of the church. He's talking about every act of service, whatever we do each day of the week. God provides the strength, and we do the loving. We love God with all the strength that he has given to us. And therefore, we love God when we teach. We love God when we visit a patient. We love God when we bake a cake. We love God as we write a card to someone who's not well. We love God in the way we answer the phone to a client. We love God as we help our children with homeschooling. That's how we love God, with all of our strength. And notice as Jesus is speaking, the repeated all, 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 all. Love the Lord with all of your heart with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. Or perhaps we could translate, with the whole of your heart. Because the Greek word is holos, which, yes, it means all, but it means the whole of something. So we love God with the whole of our heart, with the whole of our soul, with the whole of our mind, and with the whole of our strength. The whole heart means that the heart is not divided. It's not split into trying to love God, but love the world too. And the whole soul means that everything of life is lived for the glory and the honour of God. The whole mind means that our mind is not tossed around, blown about by all sorts of ideas and unsteady, but the mind that trusts fully in the promise of God and loves God for it. The whole of my strength means that with every ounce of energy, with every little bit of stamina that I have, we seek to love God in everything. 
how do I know? How do I know if I am loving God? Well, let's ask ourselves a few questions. Are we trying to learn what pleases God in every situation? If so, we're loving God. Are we doing our best to keep his commandments? If so, then we are loving God. Do we trust in his promises that he has given to us? Then we are loving God. Or reflect on the first of the Ten Commandments. If we truly love God, then we will have no other gods before him, but we'll love him exclusively. He alone is Lord and King. If we love God, then we're not going to misuse his name. We're not going to keep saying, oh my, and then use the word God when we get angry, or when we're surprised. And if we love God, then we're going to keep the Lord's day. And we're going to keep it for the Lord. We often say that actions speak louder than words. So what does our life say about our love for God? What would those closest to us say? What does our debit card or checkbook say? What does our calendar say? say. Now, we've just been saying we love God in, in all that we do, in everything that's in our calendar, but does the calendar include keeping time for worship and prayer with others for the honour of God's name? When Jesus is asked, which is the first commandment? This is his answer. Love God for all your worth. And the second, the second, command, uh, the second commandment is love your neighbor. And so secondly, today we will consider how we love our neighbor as Jesus loved everyone. Now, as we read the text, you may have noticed it said, love your neighbor as yourself. And so first I want to clear up a possible misunderstanding here. You may have heard people say, Jesus is teaching us to love ourselves and then we go and love others. In fact, some people say we need to love ourselves properly before we can love anybody else. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. Many people go through times when they feel discouraged. They perhaps even feel depressed. We live in a culture that uh, prioritizes our external looks. And so there's a lot is said about negative self-image. I don't like my nose because it's too big or my ears stick out or my... My, yeah, my stomach, I need to lose some weight. And so people say, you need to love yourself. And then you can begin to love others. If that's what Jesus was really saying, then isn't he actually giving us three commandments? When he actually simply says, the second is this. There are other occasions when Jesus talks about loving one another without adding anything about loving ourselves. When Jesus said, love others as yourself, I don't think he was saying, love people after you love yourself. So what do these two words mean? I think it's quite simply this, that the Bible recognizes that as men and women, we do love ourselves. Not necessarily in a bad way. We simply care about ourselves. If, if we feel pain, then we try to heal it. If we're hungry, then we try to eat. If we're tired, we, we try to get rest. As Paul comments, no one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it. Now, of course, there may be an extreme case from time to time when someone despises himself, even tries to self-harm. But that isn't the usual way. So when Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love yourself, all he's saying is, in exactly the same way that you care about yourself and look after yourself, that's the standard by which I want you to love your neighbor too. So how did Jesus do it? How did he love his neighbor? How can we walk as Jesus walked? Let's see how Jesus loved everyone. He was a man of compassion in the way that he responded to people who came to him and were suffering. 
compassion for the leper, for the crowds who were weary and harassed, for the widow in her grief. Now, we may not always be able to do what Jesus did, but we can show some compassion to others in their struggles, even if it means just simply being there. Jesus loved by showing respect. He valued the children who many thought should be seen and not heard. He valued the women who followed him, actions that were unheard of in his day. Jesus loved people by giving them time to listen. He listened to the woman at the well. He listened to the cries of the blind man at the side of the road. And he listened to the religious leader, Nicodemus, who came privately under cover of night. Jesus loved by encouraging. He told his disciples, I'm going to make you into fishers of men. He said to the man whose daughter was sick, don't be afraid. Trust me. And he promised all of us that when we face trial for the sake of his name, then the Holy Spirit will help us to know what to say. Jesus loved with compassion, with respect, listening, encouraging. Jesus also loved with a concern for those who experience social injustice and prejudice. For example, the woman who had been born in Syrian Phoenicia and experienced prejudice because of her nationality. The leper who had to live outside of the town and experienced prejudice because of his disability. The woman who came to anoint his feet was a woman who had a reputation. The Pharisees wonder, does Jesus know what kind of woman this is? And today, or Sunday the 14th, is Racial Justice Sunday. And last year that matter was in the public eye like never before. We saw it, we heard all about it for weeks on our television and in the newspaper. Black Lives Matter. Now, I don't accept everything that that movement stands for on a number of moral issues, but on this I agree, black lives matter. Men and women should not face prejudice or disadvantage or harassment or lack of opportunity because of the color of their skin. I've had the pleasure of visiting Africa, of living in Asia, and enjoying the most wonderful hospitality. And now, the most wonderful friendships within such a multicultural church. And it saddens me that the same has not always been the experience of men and women who've come to this country. And Jesus calls us to love our neighbor. No matter where they were born, what language they speak, or what color their skin. Jesus loved his neighbor. All of them. And when it comes to racial justice, we are called to walk as Jesus walked. And therefore, we are called to love our neighbor with kind actions. You probably know well Jesus' parable of the Samaritan, who as he is traveling along the road, sees a Jew by the side of the road. It's clear he's been beaten up and left in pain. Well, see how this Samaritan loves that Jew. First, he sees him. Second, his heart is filled with pity. Third, he goes over to him. Fourth, he does something to help. And fifth, he takes him to a place where he can rest. And then promises the innkeeper he will cover any costs for board and lodging. That's loving your neighbor. And in the Lord of Leviticus 19, God instructs his people, when a foreigner lives among you, don't ill-treat them. Love them as yourself. Loving our neighbor is being concerned about people, showing compassion in times of need. Loving our neighbor is, is actually noticing when, when someone is in need. Now, in that parable of Jesus, it was fairly obvious. But it isn't always so. A colleague, neighbor, friend, the sports club or the knitting group, they may be lonely, sad, troubled but they put on a brave smile. But love notices. Loving our neighbor is doing what we can practically. The Samaritan washed the wounds. He poured in wine to clean them and oil to heal them. 
he did what he could. And sometimes such actions may cost us a little too. A few moments of time. A little effort to go out of our way. A few pounds from our pocket. The Apostle John put it this way. Let us not love just with words, but with actions and in truth. So finally, we love our neighbor when we love all of our neighbors. That was part of the meaning of this parable of the Samaritan. Now, you may have noticed I've, I've used that phrase, and I've not yet called him the good Samaritan. Because in the text, I don't see that Jesus uses that word to describe him. It's only there in the headings in our Bibles that are not part of the actual text. And I don't think that Jesus gives him that label because Jesus doesn't want us to think that there's anything remarkable or special about that man or what he does. It's what the other two men in the story should have done and it's what he wants each of us to do. It's one simple illustration of what it means to love our neighbor. That means we love our families, which might sound easy. But remember, love is about being patient. Love is shown in kindness. Love doesn't get annoyed quickly. Have I been like that with my wife, my children, my parents? We're called to love our friends. We like to be with our friends. We enjoy their company. But remember, love is thoughtful. It's compassionate. It's caring. Have I been like that with my friends? We're called to love our neighbors. Maybe we don't see much of them in lockdown. But love might just call out over the garden fence or put a note through the door before we go to do our own shopping. And love treats all of our neighbors equally. And if one of our neighbors faces prejudice or discrimination, then we stand with them and support them. Have I been like that with my neighbors? We love our neighbors because we love our colleagues at work, which might sound a slightly strange idea. But I'm not talking about a nice feeling inside, although hopefully we do get on well with our colleagues. But love is the respect that we show our team leader. Love is a few moments to listen at coffee break to a colleague who wants to talk. Love is noticing when someone isn't themselves and is feeling a little down. And to love God and our neighbor means to love even our enemies. Now, hopefully we don't have many enemies. But maybe there are a few people we find hard to get along with. Maybe one or two who we think have treated us badly. Love does not retaliate. Love does not become bitter. Love doesn't look for ways to slander. Love forgets. And all of this, all of this is what it means to value and to love our neighbor as ourself. All of this is learning to walk as Jesus walked. William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army. And one day he was asked the secret of his success. And this is what he said. From the day I got the pall of London on my heart and the vision of what the Lord Jesus would do for them, I made up my mind that God should have all of William Booth. And so if anything has been achieved, it's because God has had all the adoration of my heart and all the strength of my will. William Booth loved God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind, and all of his strength. And he loved his neighbor as Jesus taught us to do. How are we doing? Because this is what it means to walk as Jesus walked. Amen. Let's then come and bring our prayers. As Christians, our desire is that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
So let's join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Father, as we come into your presence, it is our desire to give you the honour. We have heard how William Booth committed all of his life to you his time, his wealth, his consideration of others, the things that he did and the things that he did not do, the things that he spent his time on and the things that he avoided. Father, we recognise too often we want you to bless what we want to do. And we do not take the time or the effort to stop and ask what you would have us to do. Father, we have to confess that too often we are selective over who we love, who we will put ourselves out for. We like people to be like us. And we tend to ignore those that are not like us. Father, we have heard much about how we might live a life that honours you, both giving time to stop and reflect on your love for us, the things that you do for us day by day that we hardly take for granted and notice of. We have heard much about how we might be that good neighbour, spending time, being patient, showing kindness, showing respect, making sure that we are not discriminatory. Father, as we have heard your word this morning, May we not just hear it with our ears, but we might hear it with our whole being, so that it shapes our lives, it shapes our actions. It brings a little of this world closer to your kingdom being on earth as it is in heaven. And so, Father, we come, we bring our lives, we bring our thoughts, we bring our passions, we bring the actions of our hands, the use of our time. Help us to be like William Booth. Help us to commit all of our lives in everything that we do to you. Amen.